Right. Can I start by making a request um, to try and say hello <laughs> to the people? So if 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 you're comfortable, it would be nice if people could um, switch their camera on and briefly say hello. And what would really help me in in pitching this um, in establishing the level would be you know be really keen to to know very briefly what what your backgrounds are. Um, um, you know what your current uh, current interests are, um, but nobody <laughs> is, is switching the camera the camera on. So, um, oh, hello, hello, <laughs> hello. hi, Jolanda. Um, hi. So, um, are you happy just to tell me, you know, roughly what you're doing, so I can sure. You know, so I'm a PhD student at Imperial and I work on organic solar photovoltaics um, and I come from a physics background. So I studied physics and now the PhD is a bit more related also to chemistry. And uh, I do both experiments and modeling, although not so much modeling yet, which is why I'm interested in this um, in this talk to kind yeah. of see a okay. bit more about that. OK, brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, if if, if anyone else um, would would like to put their camera on and briefly say what they're doing, that would be, you know, I'd be really happy to to hear. Um, and it will it will help with the talk and, you know, working out how to pitch things. Hello, Gustavo, were you? Are Hi. You... Yeah, I, I just connected it to the session. Um, I'm a first year PhD student at Imperial College London yeah. in the chemical engineering department. And the idea of my project is to develop a machine learning based equation of a state yeah. but we are going to use uh, molecular simulation to generate our data yeah. okay okay very good very good um and uh nicolas um hello, hello? i'm getting a lot of we're getting a lot of background noise okay. What about now? Yeah, that's better. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I want to say hi and thank you for your talk today. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so my background is in semiconductor physics. I uh, did my PhD on uh, actually it was experimental. It was on uh, uh, dielectrics going on silicon and silicon germanium, and I started doing some. Uh, uh, DFT calculations a few years back, and then I did uh, made on uh, on two D materials mostly, and then uh, I got a uh, postdoc in Coventry for a couple of years, and I did some DFT calculations on energy related material, so mostly density of states, plant uh, structures, uh, dopants. Uh, Okay. Okay. So good. Yeah. It sounds. It sounds like quite a good. Good level of experience. Um, okay. So th thank. Thank you. So there's. There's. I can see that people have a broad range of backgrounds, um, and uh, there's some feline uh, experts as well. So um, I will. I will try and crack on, um, and um, the hope. The hope is that the, the plan is is that I will. Um, talk for two hours, um, providing um, sort of overview, very brief overview of, of um, simulations um, in the condensed phase. So in particular, talking about electronic structure simulations in the condensed phase. Um, and in the first half, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges in obtaining and the need to obtain accurate energies. Um, I'll say a little bit about, about the very broad variety of structures and the structural challenges um, that, that, that the condensed phase pose. And then we'll take a break around the hour mark. And then after the break, I'll talk a little bit about um, dynamical issues. So ab initio molecular dynamics and, uh, and quantum nuclear effects. So um, I'm Angelos Michaelides. I'm... Um, I'm at the University of Cambridge, but for many years I was I was in in London at UCL um, in the in the Thomas in the Thomas Young Centre. So um, to start with, I thought I'd show this movie. 
Um, and it's an old movie, but I but I think I think it's um, it's it's a relevant movie here because it sort of illustrates um, why we might want, first of all, want to do simulations of of condensed processes in the condensed phase, um, and also some of the some of the challenges involved. So what you're seeing here is a sodium chloride surface, um, and chlorine ions are in yellow, sodiums are in blue, and they are covered in liquid water. And just the water molecules that are coordinated to the chlorine are 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 highlighted as 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 large as large molecules. And and what you see here is is the initial stages of of the dissolution of the of the crystal. And if you think then, right, you know, how do we go about modeling this, this process? Then, you know, a lot of the challenges that 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 you have in, in doing in doing these types of these types of simulations become clear. So we have a we have a surface, um, we have molecules interacting with the surface. So those interactions need to be described accurately. Um, the water molecules themselves are hydrogen bonded to each other, and so we need to describe those forces. When the ion leaves the crystal. We now have a charged ion in solution. That's a challenge, and we're left with a charged crystal. And so there's lots of lots of real complexities that make that make this type of work challenging, but but also make this type of work interesting. And so, to sort of you know briefly summarize the the challenges that we that we have, and this is how I will try and structure this this lecture. Um, you know, some of the key issues that we have to think about are the energy. So how, how to compute accurate interaction energies for complex systems like these. Um, you know, you saw, you saw there that we were interested in water molecules on the surface. And so how do the molecules structure on the surface? Um, I'll say a little bit about this. Um, but you will hear a lot more about that next week in Chris Pickard's talk, so I will only go into that briefly. Um, you saw that we were dealing with um, a liquid, and when we want to do simulations of liquids, um, it's not sufficient to do a single calculation at one particular point in time. You want to look at how, um, how the system evolves in time, generally by computing a dynamical trajectory. And another another point that that, um, that can be relevant is usually if you do an electronic structure simulation, you you are treating the electrons quantum mechanically, but the nuclei are treated classically. There can be um, a number of occasions where um, this approximate treatment of the nuclei is is not adequate, and you need to consider the quantum nuclear effects. And I'll show some examples. Um, at the very end about, about when those issues can be, can be important. So say the first, the, first, the, first, the first thing that we want to do generally in any, any type of uh, materials simulation is we want an accurate estimate of the, of the energy. And I expect that in this course, you will have seen plots like this many times where, where I've tried to sort of summarize um, the techniques that are out there if you want to do um, an atomistic simulation of, of, uh, of a piece of matter. And so on the, on the x-axis, we're, we're plotting the you know, accuracy of the method or the predictive power or the reliability. And on the other axis, the, the, you know, the, the relative computational cost. And we have, you know, we have various methods, empirical methods, um, density functional theory, um, explicitly correlated approaches like post hartree fock methods, quantum Monte Carlo. Um, and, you know, if we, if we, if we really need um, ultimate accuracy, we have, we have, we have, we have full CI. And density functional theory has, has become the dominant, the most widely used technique in material simulation, because it, it, it provides this, this fairly good balance between, between, um, accuracy and, and computational, computational cost. And what I'll talk about, a lot of what I talk about today will be density functional theory focused. Um, but one of the big questions in density functional theory is to establish, well, how accurate it is. And in, in seeking to answer that question, often we do simulations at a higher level of theory. And in particular today, I will show some examples where, where um, quantum Monte 
Quantum Monte Carlo has provided the reference. And so there'll be a bit of a, a back and forth between, between density functional theory and, and, and Quantum Monte Carlo. So you've 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 heard you've 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 heard about density functional theory in this course. I won't I won't go into the details, but I'll we'll just sort of remind you about the total energy expression, um, where where the total energy can be written um, as as a sum of these these four terms. So the kinetic energy of the electrons, the electron ion interaction, the Hartree energy, and the exchange um, correlation energy, and the 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 really challenging component here is is the exchange exchange and correlation term and you will have heard already that that um, in density functional theory there are you know numerous count now nowadays there are countless approximations for how we deal with the uh, exchange correlation term and in the in the in the gas phase i will show a few examples um, where our understanding of the performance of exchange correlation functionals is, is, now, is now well established. Um, whereas in the condensed phase, one of the, one of the main points I will make is that in the condensed phase, we, have, um, we do not have such a, good, such a good understanding. So one um, very useful um, conceptual uh, um, way of, of categorizing exchange correlation functionals is this um, Jacob's ladder concept where um, um, where the complexity of, uh, of a given exchange correlation functional increases as we as we as we ascend our ladder um, going from ground to, to 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 higher and higher rungs of the ladder so we we start with the simplest approximation for exchange and correlation the LDA then we have um, general generalized gradient approximation and, and 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 so on as we as we go higher and higher on on uh, on Jacob's ladder so in we've got this enormous variety of, of functionals um, and this huge number of functionals has has arisen because there's you know there's no there's no ideal functional out there um, and and that um, there are well established and well known problems with approximate density functionals. Um, and so you know a number of the sort of well known shortcomings are listed here. So so there are challenges in in accounting for van der Waals dispersion forces. Self interaction can be a, can be a problem. Um, covalent bond breaking events can be can be challenging. Um, the band gaps of solids. Uh, will not be computed to a very high accuracy with some functionals and 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 so on. It's a, it's a you know it's a sort of a, a rich and thriving area of research trying to understand um, and develop new and improved improved density functionals. Um, I'll say a little bit now about about van der Waals forces because it's sort of relevant to the the types of materials that 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 um, that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, and so I think this um, simple system in the gas phase illustrates um, illustrates um, very nicely um, one problem with with many standard density functionals. So here is a is a is a is an interaction between two gas phase molecules. So um, two DNA based pair, pairs. So it's an it's an AT complex, and if you do a high quality reference calculation with an explicitly correlated electronic structure technique. So coupled cluster uh, with, with um, got the complete basis at limit, you get, you get an interaction energy of um, 68 kilojoules per mole. If you do, if you just pick up the most widely used density functional, so a GGA known as PBE, um, you get within you know, you get an error of about 10%. So you do pretty well, it's, you know, 60 versus 68 um, kilojoules per mole. That's in this hydrogen bonded configuration. If you go to, to another alternative configuration by which these base pairs can, can bond, this stacked configuration, then the reference value is 50 kilojoules per mole. Um, but now the PBE value is only six kilojoules per mole. So you go from getting, you know, 
an accuracy of 90% to to actually only recovering about about 10% of the of the of the binding. So there's a you know there's a massive um, problem there, and it comes about because um, Van der Waals dispersion forces are are critical in in the stacked in the stacked configuration. So it's problems like that 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 have motivated um, a lot of work in the in the community to develop um, density functionals that account for Van der Waals dispersion forces, and I'm you know this topic is is you know is 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 enough for a two hour lecture on its own but but i'm you know i'm not going to go into it in 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 detail um but what i want to get across on this slide is is simply the fact that when it comes to gas phase interactions and so um there's a there's a widely used and very popular data set of intermolecular interactions. So this data set known as the S22 data set is a, is a data set of um, gas phase complexes that are held together through hydrogen bonds or dispersion forces or a mixture of a mixture of both. And for this data set, accurate reference values have been computed with high level quantum chemistry methods. And so then, then we can go and test and develop density functionals and, and ask, well, how, how well does a given functional do in reproducing this, this high quality um, quantum reference data? And there's, 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 a, there's a lot in this table, but really the, you know, some of the, the key points I want to draw your attention to is if we look at um, the mean absolute deviation, and now we're in, still in units of kilojoules per mole, and you know, one kilojoule is about 10 millev. Um, in kilojoules per mole, what we find is, is, um, is we have many approaches in the gas phase that can deliver very high accuracy, that can give us precision of one kilojoule per mole, two kilojoule per mole. So for example, um, if we look at PBE, this does not deliver this accuracy. It, 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 it is very bad at describing these, um, these weakly, weak molecular interactions. So it gives a it gives a value of 11 um, kilojoules per mole for the mean absolute deviation. But if you go to something like um, Grimmer's D3 correction, then we have BLIP plus D3, we get a value of less than one. Um, a few years ago, we were involved in um, developing non-local van der Waals functionals. So here's one that, that came from my student, Yoshi Klimesh. That functional gives, again, a value of around, of around one kilojoule per mole error. So in the gas phase, um, for small intermolecular complexes, um, we have now density functionals that, that deliver a very high level of accuracy. Here's a, another example that, 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 that illustrates this point. Um, there, is, there is an interesting question um, in, in the water um, community when about about how six water molecules arrange themselves. So it's a seemingly simple question, you know, how do six water molecules bond? And um, what is the ground state structure for this isomer of six molecules? Um, and there are um, four different competing structures that, that have been discussed as putative ground states for, for the water hexamer. There's, there's this, this guy, um, that's labeled as a prism. We have we have a cage. We have something that's called a book, and we have something that's called a, that's called a ring. And if you again go and do accurate reference calculations with a technique known as with 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 coupled cluster or with um, diffusion Monte Carlo, you can very accurately um, obtain the absolute binding energies and the uh, the relative energies for these for these different states. And so. What, what the reference values say is that um, at zero Kelvin, without any zero point energy correction, the prism is slightly more stable than the, than the cage, slightly more stable than the book, slightly more stable than the, than the ring. If you go again and pick up something like, like PBE, you find, you find a sort of opposite trend. So um, with, with, um, with functionals that do not include dispersion, the book and the ring structures tend to be the one in, ones in bold, tend to be the most stable structures, whereas um, the opposite scenario is found with the reference methods. 
you can then, you know, this sort of data is again used to train and validate um, density functionals. And, and again, what we see is, is when we account for dispersion, um, the, um, the, the, the relative energies move towards the, the more compact structures. So, so the prism, the prism and the, and the cage. And again, the, the, the main point of this slide is to sort of make the point that in the gas phase, we, we can obtain very high, very high levels of accuracy for, um, you know, intermolecular interactions, relatively complicated intermolecular interactions. When it comes to the condensed phase, though, it's a, it's a different story. And the accuracy is not always as good and sort of more concerning is, 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 is the performance is even less clear cut. And it's less clear cut because we're lacking um, good quality reference data. So um, I'll show, I'll talk about a few, a few examples that, 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 illustrate, that illustrate this point. So here is a plot of the, um, of the binding energy of a molecule, a water molecule on a, on a, on a graphene sheet. So this is, a, this is a periodic, we're just seeing a small segment, but this is a periodic calculation um, in a, you know, in a, um, in a, in a, in a plane wave and supercell DFT code. Um, and what we're plotting here is the binding energy as a function of the height of the molecule, just in this one configuration for now. And what we have is, is a set of different binding curves. Each differently colored binding curve corresponds to a different DFT functional. And I haven't even labeled which, which functional is which here because it, at, at this stage, it really, it really doesn't matter. What you see is that you, if you ask DFT, what is the binding energy of, of water to graphene, then you get, in this case, these pink uh, triangles, and um, you get an answer that says, well, there's no binding whatsoever, um, down to this, this, this case, these, these uh, dark circles where you're saying, well, it's about 150 or 160, 160 milliEV. So you, you, you really don't know. And this large spread is, is actually, um, it's actually very important and, and, and actually means that we can't, we can't make um, quantitative predictions about macroscopic behavior. So, you know, one, one, um, one big question in the field is, is, is you know, what is, the, um, what is the contact angle for a liquid water droplet on graphene or, you know, on other, other materials? And you can, you know, you can, um, you can make a, a, a simple um, um, simple model to predict the, the contact angle. And if you, if you do that, if you plug in a value of, of um, 70 milli electron volts, you get a prediction for a macroscopic contact angle where you have um, a hydro, um, hydrophobic surface. If you put in a value down here of 130 milli electron volts for the binding energy, you get a completely wetted state. So you, these small differences that we're seeing here in the binding energy translate into very significant um, changes in the macroscopic behavior. Um, you know, an, an equivalent, um, an equivalent um, problem is is found when you when you look at the um, when you look at um, whether water will will wet a surface under under ambient conditions. Small changes in the in the interaction energy will tell you that under under uh, room temperature and pressure, the surface will be covered in water. Or you know if you use a different functional, you you're again predicting that there's no there's no water on the surface. So you know how do we move how do we move forward in the field? Um, and what we've been what we've been doing is 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 trying to provide accurate reference data, trying to understand the physics that controls these 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 interactions, and 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 trying to understand and develop um, density functionals to to remedy these these problems. So, one of the the first thing that we need um, is 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 you know we we need to know well what is the correct answer for a problem like this. Um, and sometimes we can we can get the correct answer for an interaction energy from experiment. 
in the gas phase, I've I've said how we can get the correct answer from a high level quantum chemistry calculation. And that's the method of choice in the gas phase. But when it comes to the when it comes to the condensed phase, um, it's very challenging to get beyond DFT reference energies. And one technique we've been we've been pursuing um, along with Dario Alfe and, and Dario gave gave the lecture the lecture last week and so I won't go into the details but the technique that 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 we've been pursuing is is, is quantum Monte Carlo um, and quantum Monte Carlo can provide extremely accurate reference data for condensed phase system and here for example um, in this graph is a plot of the um, of the lattice energy computed with um, fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo um, compared to experiment. So we're plotting the, um, the, the difference between the DMC value and the experimental value for a range of, in this case, molecular crystals. So we're looking at ice, several polymorphs of ice, um, solid CO2, um, ammonia, um, benzene, and, and, and so on. And what we plot here in gray is the um, is the error bar on the experiments. And the, the best quality DMC data here is the, is the dark green triangles. And what we can see is across the board, DMC delivers the, the accuracy and delivers um, very high accuracy within, within, the, within the experimental error bars. And what we've plotted here also is, are these squares. And these come from coupled cluster calculations. The um, coupled cluster calculations have been performed um, by um, um, by doing a um, an, um, a body um, order expansion, and so by looking at interactions between pairs of clusters and, and triplets and so on, um, and that that approach again provides very accurate reference data, um, but it's not possible to apply that approach to these larger molecular crystals and the sort of one of the, the key advantages of DMC, and you've probably heard about this last week, um, is, is that it, it, um, it has great potential for looking at, at, at relatively large system sizes because of favorable scaling with system size. So we have been um, working, and Dario um, and Andrea Zen have been, have been working on improving um, QMC to make it, to make it um, easier to use, more reproducible um, and, and, uh, and faster to use. And it's, it's, it's developments like that that allow us to, to produce reference data here for these molecular crystals. And in the next slide, um, we, we then apply QMC to this problem that I've introduced, this water molecule on graphene. And so what I'm plotting here is again, the binding energy of a water molecule on an extended periodic sheet of, of graphene. And now we're showing it in three different configurations, this guy, this guy, and this guy. And they differ just in the orientation of the, of the water molecule. Um, and I said, I said early on that, um, that DMC is, is one approach for obtaining accurate reference energies in the condensed phase. It's actually an exciting time for the field. And, and there's a significant um, amount of work going on um, in, um, in groups around the world trying to develop accurate reference methods for condensed phase. And so in particular, um, there's been work with um, Andreas Gruneis and co-workers developing a periodic coupled cluster implementation. Um, Gero Cressa has been working with, with RPA um, and, uh, and singles corrections to RPA. And so what we're showing you here, what I'm showing you is binding energy curves obtained with DMC, so the red data points, and um, coupled cluster, periodic coupled cluster from, from the Grunice group and RPA from, from, the, from the Cressa group. And what we can see is that we have a consensus here. So the binding curves uh, obtained with these um, distinct um, reference methods all, all, yield, um, all yield interaction energies that agree to within about 10. 10 milli electron volts. And so once we, once we have reference data, 
we can then go first of all and and uh, answer our problems that we care about, like the wetting of of water on on graphene, or you know, of more relevance for this talk, we can then we can then ask, well, how how does density functional theory perform for these systems now that we have reference data? And here's uh, here's a selection of of results um, where we show um, the mean unsigned error obtained with with density functional theory um, for water bonding to graphene, so these um, dark blue bars, and then also water bonding to um, to, to to different to different um, um, to different structures. So water bonding to 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 um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon clusters, so benzene and, and coronene. And again, we can see, um, first of all, we can see a big, a big improvement as we add dispersion. So, so PBE performs very poorly for these, for these types of systems. Um, when we add dispersion, we, we significantly, significantly reduce, reduce the error. And for this, um, for this particular class of problem, what we find is, you know, is, is um, having a hybrid functional, so PBE zero, um, with, with, um, with an MBD um, a treatment of, of, uh, of dispersion um, yields, the, yields the best performance. We have been working on um, extending that and, and generating with Fusion Monte Carlo um, more reference data for a wider variety of systems um, and, and using that then to, to understand um, the performance of density functionals. And so what, what I show here are, is a data set um, that we have, um, that has been published um, for water-water uh, interactions and, and water-carbon interactions. So on the top, um, we obtain reference data. You've seen these ones already for water on graphene, then water um, inside and outside of carbon nanotubes on these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and then for some of the of the bulk ice polymorphs, and for some and for some two um, D ice structures, and with this uh, reference data, we can then again start to start to understand how density functional performs. And um, I won't go into the details of these of these um, spider plots, um, but but what we what we can do is we can. Um, Look at how different categories of functionals perform, um, and so in this in this um, first first graph we look at um, PBE with various corrections. So without any correction, we have the red the raw PBE data. Again, it's performing poorly. Um, if we add um, um, the best performing fun functional, uh, the best performing combination with PBE is, uh, is a D four correction. And you can see that um, we get rather good performance, um, very good performance for water on graphene. This axis is water at the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, very good. Um, 2D ice, 3D ice is, 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 is performing less well. Water in the carbon nanotubes is, is again getting within the first circle, which is an error of 25 milliEV. And you can see, you can go from PBE plus van der Waals to um, the non-local van der Waals functionals um, to hybrid functionals. And, and overall, the best performing functional we see for these water and, and carbon systems is, is PBE zero with a, with, a D, with a D4 correction. And that can then guide um, our subsequent application studies that, 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 um, um, that, we then, that we then carry out on this system. Um, one, one different type of problem um, that is, is very uh, useful, I think, and, and, important to, and important to highlight is, is I've said that you know, these hydrogen bonding interactions are challenging, water molecules interacting with surfaces are challenging, um, but you know, also, also in, the, in the condensed phase, if we take something like an oxide and we and we make a defect, um, then then the, again 
Um, that's a challenging system for density functional theory because often um, you're talking about a situation where you have um, a delocalized electronic structure of the solid and maybe a, a localized state associated with a defect or a partially localized state. And those types of situations um, where you have rather uh, distinct types of, of, um, of electronic um, um, states can, can often be a, be a challenge for a challenge for DFT. Um, and so you know one um, one particularly um, interesting um, class of problem is the question if, if you have an oxide material um, and, and you make a vacancy, so you, you remove the, 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 um, the oxygen from, from the material, how does density functional theory? Um, perform in in describing this 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 type of this type of problem, and this is a type of question that um, that uh, Alex Schluger, the course organizer, has, has has spent a lot of a lot of a lot of his career working on, um, and what I'm showing you here is is some recent um, results we have, where we. Um, where we obtained um, vacancy formation energies um, based on coupled cluster. So in, in particular, um, we obtained um, converged cl coupled cluster values um, for um, oxygen vacancy um, formation energies in magnesium oxide at the bulk and at the surface and titanium oxide at the bulk and, and at the surface. And um, the particular Recipe, recipe we applied to get the accurate reference data is, is we did um, embedded cluster calculations um, of, of increasingly large size where we, where we had a quantum cluster treated with coupled cluster. Um, and we, we, um, we looked at um, steadily increasing, increasing clusters and we corrected for um, system size effects basis set effects and, and obtained what we hope are accurate reference data for, for these vacancy formation energies. And then we can go and ask, well, how do different density functionals do in, in, in describing these vacancy formation energies? And on, in this plot here, that's what, we, that's what we see. And I've split the performance into, again, um, the classes of functional. So according to these rungs of Jacob's ladder, so um, down here we have GGA functionals, then we have meta GGAs, then we have hybrids, and then we and then we have double hybrid hybrids, and the the energy axis here is showing the difference from the reference value, and what you can see again is consistently um, PBE is performing rather poorly. It's 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 producing deviations from the reference value of, of, a, of more than half an EV. Interestingly, as you ascend the rungs of Jacob's ladder, the overall performance Im improves on, on average. And, and we find that these, these uh, double hybrid functionals um, produce vacancy formation energies um, that, that, that come close to the error bar associated with the underlying with the underlying coupled cluster calculation. So um, that's pretty much all I want to say about, um, about energetic um, considerations. Um, before, I, I think it's important though, just to remember that in, in talking about how do we compute the total energy, um, I focused on, on the exchange correlation functional. Um, and I focused on variations in, in energies um, with different functionals. Um, you know, that, that's, that's because the functional is the, is, the, is the single most significant approximation in, in, in DFT. But in doing, in, in doing DFT calculations in practice, it's, it's, it's important to remember that there are other um, significant sources of, of, of error um, that it's really important that, that are taken into consideration each time 
um, you know, you look at a system each time you, you want to do a calculation on a system. And, you know, the, some of the particular issues that, that are important to think about are, you know, the basis set that, that you are using, whether you're doing all electron or pseudopotential calculations, and if the latter, are the pseudopotentials good enough? Um, whether are, there are any interesting spin states in the system, even, you know, for weakly interacting systems, the, the level of um, convergence of your self-consistent field cycle or the force convergence, these are, you know, these are issues that, that really um, are important to, to think about. Likewise, if these are condensed phase sy systems, and so, so you might be sampling your, um, your, um, your electronic brilliant zone um, with, with a number of K points, um, the results that you obtain, depending upon the, the electronic structure of the system, can be very sensitive to the choice and number of K points. Um, if you are trying to simulate molecules, for example, on surfaces, then it's, and you're using a slab, it's important to, to ensure that the dimensions of your unit cell are converged. If you have a vacuum region above the slab, that, that you have sufficient vacuum. And there's a lot of these you know, um, not very exciting, but but really, really very important issues that 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 it's that it's important to take into 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 consideration. Um, if if you are hoping to do a calculation that um, you know in five years' time, after your PhD, after your research period, that someone will will trust and someone will really really care about. Um, you know those those types of issues are are important and and in uh, in uh, in Dave Bowler's book and and Veronica Brazdova's book, um, they so these are um, a, a former and a and a current member of the TYC, um, they talk about these these details in their in their in their in their at a, at a quite a nice introductory level in their in their very nice book and so I would recommend I would recommend that. Um, so, so um, that was what I wanted to say about energies. Very briefly now, before taking a break, I want to say something about about structures, and and um, in the in the condensed phase, there often can be you know a, a very rich variety of structures that 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 have very similar energies, and so you know we we in order to to get the right ground state structure, we need to have um, an accurate um, energy prediction, um, but also we need to sample configuration space, and we 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 need to be open and and um, open to the prospect of, of 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 a wide variety of structures. And so, one um, you know one one sort of um, prominent example is is the phase diagram of of, of water. So. Um, it, it turns out that almost every year a new a new um, crystalline phase of ice is is discovered, um, and there are now almost um, there, there are now twenty distinct polymorphs of 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 ice, and these are um, almost apart from one. These are all um, molecular crystals that are held together through hydrogen bonding and and van der Waals forces. Um, and uh, you know the, the the main difference between the the different phases between all of these these distinct phases is simply the arrangement of the of the water molecules, how they are packed, um, and and how they hydrogen bond to each other. Um, what's what's sort of quite remarkable is is we have this rich variety of phases, um, but they actually all come within an incredibly small energy window of each other, and so that's. That's what this plot is showing here. So here's a plot of the of the raw lattice energy um, of um, a selection of the ice polymorphs, and um, there are experimental values. So the experimental values are these uh, light blue values. So for some of the phases, we have experimental values. So so here's one for ice one, ice two, ice three. Um, that's I six and 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 so on. And the most sort of 
noteworthy um, feature of, of this plot is if you look at the is if you look at the energy scale. So we're plotting the lattice energy in kilojoules per mole. And if you look at the experimental values, they're all within about a five, um, or at most 10, well, not, not 10, but less than less than 10 kilojoule per mole energy window. So the whole of this ice phase diagram is, is compressed into this incredibly um, narrow total energy, total energy window. And so if you if you um, you know if you want to go out and and make accurate predictions about the polymorphs of, of ice, first of all, you need to identify them. Um, and then you need you need um, you need to have a very high level of, of 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 electronic structure treatment to to describe them. And again, I, I'm not going to, to dwell on this, but um, this was work that was done by um, a student in the group, Flaviano. And I said the blue is the experimental data. What Flaviano has managed to do is, is, is get diffusion Monte Carlo data for these phases and then use that to, to, to test the performance of different, different density functionals. Um, one, one other um, way to illustrate that in the condensed phase, the variety of structures can be very complex is, is, is to simply look at what should be um, a very simple situation. Um, and, and that is, if you, if you take a flat surface, in, in this case, an atomically flat metal surfaces, and you deposit um, a layer of water on top, and you ask, well, what, what is the, and you do this at, at ultra low temperatures, at cryogenic temperatures, and you ask, well, what is the, what is the structure of the first layer of, of water on these, on these surfaces? Um, and you can, you can do experiments to probe the structure. And so what I'm showing you here are the results from um, a scanning tunneling microscopy, a set of different scanning tunneling microscopy experiments, looking at this first layer of ice on, on different metal surfaces. And you know, we look at the experiments were done on different surfaces. So they were done on silver, ruthenium, copper, palladium. And, and what you see here is, is that in each case, uh, a different structure forms. And so if you're doing simulations to, to, um, to try and understand, well, what, what is, the, is the structure that forms, you, you really need to do a large amount of, of sampling. Um, to try and establish well what is the what is the right what is the right um, structural arrangement of the molecules on the on the surface, and next week Chris Pickard will talk about one of the approaches we we use a, a technique or an approach that he, he's pioneered and that's um, a technique known as ab initio random structure searches, um, where where you um, generate a large number of of at random configurations for for your system you minimize the total energy and you and you try and identify the the ground state the ground state structure um, again just to 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 sort of illustrate before taking a break um, that that um, systems can be incredibly delicate um, and 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 I think this this set of images illustrates um, the delicacy um, um, quite nicely. So this is an STM image um, of an ice film um, on, a, on a copper surface. And what we have down in this bottom right-hand corner is, is, um, is an ice surface covered in a single layer of water. Uh, is it, sorry, is a copper surface covered in a single layer of water? And in the remaining uh, region, and uh, we have we have a copper surface covered in, in two layers of water. And if you go about and and you obtain higher resolution imaging and you do a density functional calculation and you consider possible structures, um, what what what's been identified is that in this contact layer, you have a very simple hexagonal arrangement of of, of molecules. It's a nice it's a nice film. But already in this second layer, if you then, if you then try and establish 
well, what is the unit cell? What is the arrangement of the water molecules? You get this rather complicated four times root three unit cell. Um, and again, when you do you know, extensive structure search, um, we find that the most stable structure is this, is, this, uh, is this complex structure made out of heptagons and pentagons um, with this high degree of, of, of buckling. And so a, again, this, this just illustrates that in trying to solve structures for overlayers on surfaces, and there's a very delicate interplay between the interaction of the molecules with the surface and the, 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 the hydrogen bonding of the molecules with, with each other, and that this really can, can lead to a wide variety of structures and that these structures can, fall, can, um, can reside within a very narrow energy window. Um, and, and I think I've essentially said what is, on, what is on, on this slide is really that care needs to be taken to identify the correct low energy structures. Um, it's very beneficial if you can connect with experiment and and next week uh, Chris will say will say a lot a lot more about that. Um, so just to wrap up before we before the break, um, some of the the key points that I was trying to emphasize um, are that um, you know unlike in the gas phase you know condensed phase simulations can be quite challenging. Um, DFT is now one of the physical science's biggest success stories, and it's you know it's it's, it's driving development in lots of fields. It's driving this computational materials discovery revolution, and DFT is incredibly useful, incredibly powerful, you know. But um, but there are a lot of problems um, that challenge DFT. Um, the results obtained from DFT are highly sensitive to the exchange correlation functional. Um, you know, one of the big challenges is, is dispersion interactions. And, that, and by dispersion, I mean van der Waals forces. There have been a lot of developments to improve the description, um, but, but nonetheless, you know, much more work is needed, especially in the, in the condensed phase. So um, I can, we can pause there. Um, but if there are any um, questions on the first half, then I'm happy to take um, questions now. Um, okay, so if there aren't uh, any- can I, oh. can I ask a question, please? Yes, hello. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. When, <clears throat> I would like to ask you, when calculating the formation energies for defects, uh, the hybrid functionals, uh, is there anything that we should uh, be very careful of or any difference when uh, doing the, the calculation for the PB, for example? Because uh, uh, up to now, I haven't got any correct numbers with uh, functionals like PB. Zero or HSE. So, um, so what is maybe um, maybe if I know more about your system, I might be able to provide a, a better okay. answer. What is your system? <laughs> well, for example, let's say that we want to calculate the titanium dioxide, and we have a super sum, and uh, we want to calculate the the formation energy of uh, an oxygen vacancy. Yeah. So. Are these calculations very uh, sensitive to, for example, forces, or do you have to do anything specific uh, using a hybrid function? Um, yeah, so they, so they, you know, they, they are, um, you know, very sensitive to, um, to a lot of parameters. Um, so I, I guess you can see this this um, slide again. Mm -hmm. um, so. TiO2, you know, you, I think in, in mentioning TiO2, you've, you know, you've, you've picked the most painful um, and the most sensitive um, system. Um, and so with, with, with TiO2, um, you know, there are mm -hmm. very significant relaxation effects. Um, there are um, the semi-core electrons can be important. So if you're using pseudopotentials, you, you really need to, to, to check um, that sufficient number of electrons are treated as 
I treat it as 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 valence. Um, and um, you know, we we see here. Um, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, you know, we we see here for um, um, you know, so for here's you know here's a HSE uh, zero six. Uh, result so TiO2 is the, the TiO2 bulk is the circle so that's you know that's getting mm -hmm. within within about 0.2 electron volts of the of, of the reference value um, but you know that that took us um, a lot of effort to really ensure that our calculations were were um, okay. were, were converged so it's it's a, you know, it's a very challenging system and mm -hmm. and a way in a way um, it was this that, that additional slide I added where I, I talked about the challenges in terms of pseudo potentials, K points, um, the level of convergence. I think it was for problems like this that that I that I think is yeah. really really important to 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 um, to emphasize that. So you actually need to use a lot of computational power and a lot um, of time to make sure that everything is done uh, correctly. You have to take care. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to take care. If you, um, you know, if if you um, you know, if you want to compute a quantity, it's not you know, and you want to have a result that you trust and that other people will trust and value in years to come, then it's it's important to to, okay. to ask yourself, you know, um, what are all the assumptions and approximations that I'm making in this calculation. Um, and uh, and you know what level of error do, does each one of those approximations introduce? Thank you. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any other um, questions. So what I would say is let's take a um, seven minute break. And so we'll be back at five past. And in the second half, I'll talk a bit more. I'll talk about dynamics, uh, ab initio MD, um, and uh, um, quantum nuclear effects. So uh, I will um, see you then.
<coughs> okay, so um, welcome back. Am I? Um, I think yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Um, welcome, welcome back, everybody. Um, what we're going, what I'm going to cover in this in this part is um, I'm going to say something about um, dynamics, um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about um, how ab initio molecular dynamics is is useful, but but also um, very expensive computationally. Um, machine learning is is providing um, a, a very competitive alternative to ab initio MD. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, quantum nuclear effects. So can I just check that people can hear me because I can see the, the little green speaking boxes around Nicholas and yes, right. Right, thank you. Um, so, if you, what I've showed you so far is, is um, I've not talked about finite temperature effects. So I've not, not, not talked about dynamics, but you know, there's many problems. There's many problems where we really care about um, the dynamical evolution of the, of the system. And, you know, this, this movie here, for example, illustrates one of the, one of the systems that, you know, that we're interested in. It's a liquid water film on a zinc oxide surface. So a water oxide interface. Um, and it's not playing very well. Um, and what you have here are, you know, liquid water molecules in, in red, molecules at the interface um, in orange that dissociate. And there's a dynamic equilibrium between um, intact and dissociated molecules. And that's the sort of process that you need um, an ab initio um, technique um, to be able to treat because you've got this bond breaking and bond making going on. I'm just going to move off this slide because I can hear my computer heating up. Um, and and uh, you know some of the other types of questions that we were interested in that were on that that were on that slide are issues about um, you know the wetting. Of surfaces and um, questions about the friction so how liquids flow across solid surfaces are, are are very important and and in the case of water how water dissolves crystals so these are all questions that involve important um, dynamical processes so often bond making and bond breaking events and it's insufficient to just do a single total energy calculation in order to understand the, the system. And um, ab initio MD is, is uh, you know, is, has been for several years the method, the method of choice. And ab initio MD provides a, a clean way to compare systems, interfaces with with different distinct electronic structures. And so here's, here's one example where we've got a liquid water film on a graphene sheet, a liquid water film on a boron nitride sheet, and we can, we can compare the differences. In this case, it, it turns out that they actually, the liquid water density, so here's a plot of height from the sheet of the density. What we see is that there's, there's very little difference between these, between these, two, between these two systems. Um, I showed you this this video at the beginning at the beginning of the talk. It's it's another type of process that we might be interested in exploring. We have a crystal. Um, ions in the crystal are going into solution, so there's a there's a dissolution event. And again, this involves bond making and bond breaking. There's a complicated electronic structure, and and we might we you know we 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 really need. Um, an ab initio treatment in order to understand understand this this type of a problem. So, I've 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 said in the earlier half of the of the lecture um, that if you want to do a good quality simulation of a material, the choice of the exchange correlation functional is is critical. Um, and you know even at zero Kelvin, we need to think about things like the basis set, pseudo potentials, and so on. 
Then when it comes to liquids, to doing molecular dynamics, then we have a whole new set of issues that we have to think about. Um, and these are not limited to, but include um, the time step by which we evolve our, our molecular dynamics trajectory, and the ensemble, the thermo or barostat, um, and, and also the length of the trajectory. And typically when we're doing an ab initio MD simulation, we are, you know, we are, we are limited in, in our system size um, to, to a few hundred atoms at, at most, you know, on, you know, on a sort of you know, routine type of calculation. And our trajectories are severely limited um, to tens or maybe hundreds of, of, of picoseconds. And so this, this is a, you know, this is a, a significant shortcoming of our of, of, of almost all ab initio MD simulations. And I can sort of illustrate the, the, the problem here. So this is, um, this is data taken from a review article um, in which um, we show um, oxygen, oxygen, G of Rs for liquid water. Um, and um, so we're showing um, it, we're showing um, the results from three different density functional treatments and against, against experiment. And so experiment is this sort of black data. So we've got, we've got uh, two different um, sets of experimental data. What you can see, first of all, is, is, and this will not be a surprise based on the earlier part of this lecture, we see um, the peak height um, depends, upon the, depends upon the functional used. But what's, what's, what's more alarming, and I'll show you in the next slide, is that you know, nominally identical simulations um, have been run in which you know, different results are obtained. And so here is a compilation from, from the same review article um, of the ab initio MD simulations performed with the BLIP functional. Um, and um, you can see here the system size, so the number of water molecules, the temperature, um, and one of the main um, outputs, one of the main observables, the, the oxygen, oxygen, um, G of R, so the peak height of that G of R, so the, the height of this peak that you had been, that you had been seeing here. And you know, you can see there's about, there's at least 20 of these, of these BLIP simulations that have been performed over the years. And if you look at the range of peak heights obtained, then it's, it's an incredibly broad range. And, you know, I've, I've highlighted the two, the two extremes here. So we go from a value of less than three to a value of 3.6. And, and, you know, largely this deviation in the results obtained is down to the fact that that you know that none of these simulations have have been performed for a long enough um, simulation time, or you know to be sort of you know a bit more sort of political and you know careful in the statement you know they've they've all really been on the edge of what you know of of, of what of what is possible, and so um, given that it's then it's then worth exploring well. Um, you know, can we can we over overcome this 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 challenge? Um, you know, are there techniques out there that will allow us um, to have ab initio accuracy, um, but at a at a at a reduced computational cost? And you know, um, no one will be surprised to hear um, that this is where this is where machine learning comes in, um, and. You know, we know there's a long tradition of applying and developing classical force field models to simulate materials and simulate liquids. Um, quantum approaches um, are generally, but not always, generally more, more accurate, more transferable, um, but they, they come at a, at a much greater cost. Can we, um, with, with machine learning, um, develop techniques that have retain the um, retain the, the predictive power of the quantum mechanical approaches 
um, but come at a cost that's closer to the closer to the force field methods. And you know this is a this is a big field. Um, and at the beginning of these lectures, I heard that one or two of you were were you know working um, uh, doing research in in this area. Um, and uh, um, a month or so ago, you had a lecture from Venkat Kapil. Um, Venkat is a colleague of mine here in Cambridge, um, and 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 Venkat went into a lot of detail about about um, developing training and ab initio quality machine learning potentials. So I I won't go into the details here, but I will take a few slides um, to. Um, to, to talk about some recent developments from from our group um, and and I will try and illustrate how these techniques are really very useful for um, improving the quality of simulations in the in the condensed phase so um, you know there are this is a booming field and there are many approaches out there for developing um, machine learning potentials to of the leading and distinct um, Groupings are um, the Gaussian approximation potentials, so the gap potentials, um, pioneered by by Gabor Chani, and high dimensional neural network potentials. Um, this essentially, um, you know, pioneered by by um, Jörg Baylor and Michaela Paranello. And um, you know, in a sort of um, overly simplistic representation, um, what 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 you do is you generate some training data and, and that training data typically, but not always typically comes from density functional theory. So you can do a density functional theory calculation. You generate energies and forces for a set of configurations. You come up with some way to represent um, the structures that you have at, uh, with local atomic description, descriptors. You develop an initial potential. You you um, you test it you you know against some validation data, and you you iterate until you have a potential that that uh, that you are satisfied with, and then you can apply it to a larger, more complex system. And these particular images that I've shown here are all carbon systems, um, and that's that's because um, with with Gabor with with Gabor Chani with Volker Deringer and 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 this was Patrick Rose. PhD work, um, we worked on developing a general purpose machine learning potential um, that could describe carbon in all of its phases and all of its, all of its polymorphs. Um, and um, that potential, um, carbon gap 20, um, is very transferable across different phases of, 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 of carbon. Um, and uh, um, and is very useful if you are if you are interested in in studies of of um, of, of pure pure carbon. But one of the one of the frustrations um, that we had in developing this this general purpose potential is 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 that it was very time consuming um, to generate and test training data for such a broad. Um, part of configuration space. Um, what we were, um, I've shown you examples of, of condensed phase systems that, that we are interested in, so solid liquid systems. Um, what we were interested in, in doing in more recent work is, is understanding, um, can we develop machine learning potentials um, that are not general purpose, um, but that simply enable us to extend the system size and the simulation length that can be achieved with, with ab initio molecular dynamics. And so the basic, the basic um, objective or the basic question that we had at the beginning is, well, we know now that we can run ab initio trajectories for system sizes of you know, a few hundred atoms. We can run dynamical trajectories for a few tens, maybe 100 picoseconds. Um, can we use this data to, to generate um, machine learning potentials that, that allow us to 
significantly extend the simulation length and uh, and the system and the system size. And the um, the sort of um, goal here, um, hopefully it's clear. It was not it was not to develop general purpose potentials, but to develop potentials that could describe this specific system. Um, the other sort of frustrations that we had in, in, in developing a general purpose potential were, were that, um, um, you know, originally we were doing, you know, manual um, testing and validation. Um, there was a lot of um, human intervention in selecting parameters and selecting configurations. So could we automate this, this, this whole process and could we um, identify general sets of descriptors and hyperparameters that would allow us um, to rapidly explore a variety of distinct systems. Um, and so this is the this is the um, the sort of a slide that summarizes what we managed to do and the systems we we looked at. Um, so you've seen this you've seen this already. We start out with an ab initio trajectory, then we use an active learning framework in which we train um, neural network potentials and we're training potentials of the Baylor Paranello type that, that that you heard you know much more about in in, in Venkat's, Venkat's lecture uh, a month or so ago. Um, we use an active learning framework that identifies structures um, that that um, and that the system has not seen before and these new structures are used as as uh, as, as 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 training data. Um, the particular particular recipe that we're using here is where is we um, found it useful to to use a committee neural network approach, um, and and the committee approach is is useful because um, you can look at the predicted. Um, um, you can look at the predictions from each member of the committee, and if there's a significant deviation between between uh, predictions from different committee members, this can give you an indication that that uh, that your potential is not accurate for this particular particular configuration. Um, and and also, when you run an actual trajectory again, you can look at the errors predicted by the by the various committee members, and this can give you an indication. If you are simulating in a regime that your potential is comfortable in simulating, or if you are going into an, you know, an extrapolation regime. Um, another another um, aspect to this that 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 we wanted to that we wanted to address is is it can take in generating machine learning potentials. It can take as much time and um, testing and validating potentials. Um, as it as it as it can developing them, um, it's essentially you know a, a, a cyclic process, and and we we wanted to come up for these classes of systems, so these you know complex interfacial condensed phase systems where we've got a solid and a liquid, we wanted to um, come up with an automated way of testing and validating, and and to do this we um, we relied on the standard information that, that you might compute if you're looking at, at a liquid or a solid liquid interface. So we looked at the radial distribution functions for the relevant atomic species. Um, the vibrational properties of systems are very important. And so we, we, um, and we want to describe, so we, we, we again looked at the vibrational density of states obtained from our MD, MD trajectories and the standard force, force plots. And, each one of these um, testing, um, each one of these properties, was then was then um, combined into a generalized scoring scheme, um, from which we could obtain a number that would give us an indication of how uh, accurate our potential was for the types of systems we were interested in, and and um, for all of the various systems we used. We explored, so we looked at water um, in molybdenum sulfide, water in boron nitride nanotubes, water at the TiO2 interface, carbon nanotubes, ions in in water. Um, for each one of these systems, 
our automated active learning approach for training and automated um, testing approach produced potentials that yielded um, very high levels of agreement with the initial ab initio training data. So to sort of um, show then, well, what can you do then? So um, um, on the, the movies are not playing very well today and it's because my computer seems to be unhappy. It's, it's uh, making a lot of noise. So what we have here is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is the system that we were able to simulate with ab initio molecular dynamics. Um, and so this was a fairly chunky system. So we had four, more than 400 atoms and we were able to run a, a simulation for 30 picoseconds. Um, each, each simulation step took you know, 25 seconds per, per step. With, with our um, committee neural network potentials, we you know, really can look at system sizes that are you know, four times as large we can, we can look at trajectories that are, you know, more than a hundred times as long, and this can be done at a, at a, you know, at a fraction of the, of the computational cost. And so then that allows us to address these issues that, that I mentioned at the beginning about, about the question marks um, associated with the length of our trajectory. So we can, we can resolve that and we can have confidence that, that quantities that we compute um, deliver the come with the ab initio accuracy, but also um, we've we've made a proper treatment of the of the statistical mechanics of the system. And so, um, let me try one more time on this movie. Uh, you know that doesn't seem to want to work, but but the really the you know the the sort of most illustrative. Um, um, way of you know, the, the, the sort of key way of demonstrating the, the value of, of having these larger simulations over longer trajectories is this plot on the bottom right here. So this is a, is a plot of the um, free energy surface that the water molecules feel um, in the contact layer. So this is, this is in the, um, here's a plot of the density of the molecules in the system as a function of height. And what we find is we have a, a well-defined um, contact layer of molecules that are bonded to the surface. If we look at the free energy associated with motion of these molecules across the surface, then you know if we we run our ab initio MD trajectory, we get um, you know we we have insufficiently good statistics to say anything about about the corrugation of this free energy surface. With um, with the neural network potential, and um, we can now talk about well what are the actual free energy barriers for molecules to move to move across the surface. Another example um, where these techniques allow us to really, you know, significantly transform um, the, the, the sort of um, the phase space that we can explore um, comes from this example here. Um, and, and this this study is a study done by Venkat Kapil, also in Cambridge. So Venkat is the, I mentioned that Venkat gave the, gave the lecture about a month ago. Um, what, what Venkat was interested in here is understanding if we take water and we confine it between, between graphene sheets, um, what is the phase diagram of, of the nano confined water? Um, and in particular, we're interested in knowing how the phase diagram changes as a function of, of temperature and of the um, pressure that the graphene sheets impose upon, uh, impose upon, the, upon the water molecules. And in previous work with, with ab initio techniques, um, we were able to look at one state point. We were able to look at uh, zero pressure almost zero pressure and at room temperature. So we were able to look at one single state point. Um, also with ab initio techniques, um, us and others were able to look at zero temperature and work out um, the relative energies of different phases at zero temperature. 
So we could look at a few points along this axis and, 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 and essentially one point at, at, at finite temperature. That, although those simulations were, um, you know, state of the art, um, they, they are insufficient to, to actually tell you about the full phase behavior of this, of this system. And so what, what we were able to do is train the machine learning potentials that deliver this, this ab initio accuracy, and then use the techniques of the standard techniques of statistical mechanics to map out this phase diagram. And, and that then revealed an incredibly rich phase diagram where we have um, on the left, um, a variety of molecular crystal polymorphs. So we have a hexagonal, a pentagonal, um, rhombic and square phases. Um, we can work out the melting temperatures. So we have, we see that depending upon the applied pressure, we have a melting temperature for this nano-confined ice that varies from um, 200 Kelvin up to, you know, several hundred degrees higher. There's a regime where the water molecules dissociate and we have um, a super ionic phase. And it's an incredibly rich phase diagram that, that I, you know, you don't care about the details, um, but it's, it's really the, the opportunities that um, these um, machine learning potentials offer for, 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 um, for learning new insights in this, in this field is, is what I wanted to, want to, wanted to get across. So the final of the four um, topics that I will talk about is, is something that has um, not been covered so far. And that's the fact that um, quantum nuclear effects can be, can be important in, in, um, in, in, in certain systems. And so, you know, the vast majority of, of electronic structure simulations of materials um, assume that we have that we have classical nuclei, um, and our electrons are the are the quantum the quantum objects. Um, but there are there are scenarios where where we really need, especially when we have a light mass, where we really need to take into consideration the the quantum nature of the the quantum nature of the nuclei. Um, and I can show you this video, which. Um, is something that you shouldn't shouldn't do at home, but serves to illustrate a, a point. <laughs> so um, people um, the people cannot tunnel through barriers, um, but atoms can. And so you know, if we think about that that guy there that you just saw. Um, and if we ask, well, um, what is the thermal de Broglie wavelength of a, of a person, then this is um, Planck's constant divided by, um, my line has disappeared, divided by momentum. And the thermal de Broglie wavelength of a human is something like 10 to the minus 36 of a meter. And, and if you think about, you know, um, a human tunneling through, through a wall, then the wall might be, you know, a meter or whatever, you know, a few hundred centimeters um, wide. And so there's, there's an infinitesimally small probability of the, of the wave function of the human um, um, penetrating this, this wall. When it comes to atoms, on the other hand, um, the, the, um, the relevant distance scales do match up. The thermal de Broglie wavelength of a of a light of a light atom could be something on the level of a few of a few angstrom, um, and the relevant distance for an atom to tunnel, you know, tunneling just half an angstrom or one angstrom in many systems can can lead to a, a bond making or a bond breaking event. It can be it can be a, you know um, um, an interesting process, and so if we want to account for these effects. Um, then one computationally expedient approach is, is a technique known as um, is, is Feynman's path integral approach. And, and again, you know, I think, you know, like all of the four components of this, of this lecture, um, you know, this could easily be, you know, um, a lecture course or a, or a few hour lecture on its, on its own. So I'm, I'm not going to 
um, go into the, any of the details of what of what path integrals are. Um, and I'll just give you a very simple um, conceptual idea that if you're interested in, you can then you can you know well if you understand already then then hopefully you won't disagree with what I draw. And if you if you're interested, then you can go off and read and read more. So in in um, in um, in Feynman's path integral approach, um, what you do is you is you um, um, is you want to represent um, a, a quantum object um, as a series of classical replicas um, that are all coupled through harmonic spring constants, and the 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 mass the spring constant of the of the um, of the harmonic oscillator depends upon temperature and mass. And so the lighter the mass or the lower the temperature, the more delocalized the, the, um, the quantum object becomes. And so, you know, this was um, one of the um, first people in our team, Singjin, who was involved with these path integral simulations. And so essentially, you know, if we want to represent Singjin as a, as, a, as a quantum object, what we would do is have a series of classical replicas coupled through um, temperature and mass dependent spring constants. And if we look at a molecule, then, you know, then this is a typical path integral representation of, of, uh, of, of, of a molecule. And you can see here, the hydrogen atoms have the lightest mass. They, they are the species that are the most delocalized. The heavier carbon and nitrogen atoms are still treated quantum mechanically, but the extent of delocalization is, is significantly reduced compared, compared to hydrogen. And so if you, if, you want, if you want then to do a path integral simulation, you, you're essentially doing a density functional theory simulation or a whatever classical force field simulation, and you were running N replicas of that, of that system. Um, and, and, and there are, you know, this is implemented in, in DFT codes, and there's the you know, very uh, nice and, and useful um, IPI wrapper that can integrate with, with many codes. So to show you some examples of when quantum nuclear effects can be, can be, can be important, um, one of the problems we've been interested in is, is understanding um, how do hydrogen atoms um, stick to surfaces? How do they move across surfaces? Um, and and uh, this, is, this is relevant for um, catalysis. Um, it's, it's relevant for hydrogen storage. It's also relevant um, to understand um, a very simple process of hydrogen formation in, in the interstellar medium. Um, and so um, we were interested in understanding um, how, do, um, how important are quantum nuclear effects in, in the process by which a hydrogen atom will go from the gas phase um, onto the surface um, of, of a graphene sheet. And what you have here is a plot of of the hydrogen atom distance above the surface. Um, and so we have a hydrogen atom, we have a periodic um, graphene sheet, and we do a PBE calculation, and we can establish the, the barrier for this, for this process. And it's a small barrier. Um, it's about 0.2 electron volts, but there is, there is a physical, physical barrier there. So that would mean if, if we were to translate this into the interstellar medium, then that would mean that, that the hydrogen atoms cannot stick to carbonaceous materials because this, this barrier by far exceeds the thermal energy that's available. So I've, I've complained a few times about PBE um, not accounting for dispersion forces. And it's known that hydrogen, first of all, fizzes orbs um, uh, uh, above, um, above graphene before it will it will um, it will make a, a covalent bond, and so if you if you use a functional that accounts for van der Waals dispersion forces, the green line this is the opt PBE functional, then you do have a fizzy's option well, um, and then you need to overcome that barrier to um, to to go into the the chemi the deep lying 
chemizoid state. And you might ask, well, you know, why, why should there be any barrier at all? And, and you know, a, a barrier is physically sensible because um, the, the carbon atoms go from being sp2 bonded um, in graphene um, to being close to sp3 bonded when they are hydrogenated. And there's a buckling. So this, this heavy carbon atom has to penetrate, has to move out from the lattice slightly. So then, um, then we can ask, well, these profiles that I've shown here are just at zero Kelvin. So these are just potential energy barriers. Um, what about finite temperature effects? It, still at this stage with classical nuclei. And, and so to do that, we can use thermodynamic integration and we can compute the free energy barrier. And that's the pink, that's the pink, the pink data. And then the final thing, if we include the quantum nuclei, we can do a thermodynamic integration with our quantum nuclei and we get the black line. And so the black line is our best estimate for what happens in this system. And, and what we see is that the um, quantum nuclear effects significantly wash out this classical barrier. And I can show you this, this um, movie that illustrates what happens um, that, that, that Erland has made. So initially we have this um, hydrogen described as a path integral above our graphene sheet. It's in the fizzy zord well. Then as we push it closer to the surface, it starts to drape over the barrier. And this is what a tunneling event looks like in a, in a path integral simulation. And as we push the hydrogen closer, it overcomes the barrier and then it starts. Oh, another movie that has stopped. Um, the final point, which we're not gonna be able to see, simply shows the hydrogen um, localized um, as a more classical-like particle when it's, when it's um, chemisorbed onto the, onto the graphene sheet. Fortunately, these, these, these figures illustrate the point. So here is, is um, um, a representation of the beads of the path integral averaged over time um, in the physisorbed state, at the transition state, and at the chemisorbed at the chemisorbed final state, and you can see a significant uh, difference in the extent the extent of, of delocalization, and and what what we see through these combined effects of of um, of van der Waals forces and quantum nuclear effects that the barrier comes down from a PBE value of about two hundred milli electron volts down down to um, you know down to ten percent of that 20, 20 milli electron volts. One other example where quantum nuclear effects can be, can be important is, um, is the diffusion of, and this is the, this is the last thing I will, I, will, um, I, will, I will show, is the diffusion of um, molecules across surfaces. And so 20 years ago now, there was a, a really important experimental study where they, they, um, they used scanning tunneling microscopy um, to explore um, the rate of diffusion of water molecules and water clusters across, across a metal surface, across a palladium surface. And they were able to distinguish between water molecules and water clusters by their size. Um, and what they saw when, is that when two single water molecules came together to form a dimer, the rate of diffusion of the dimer significantly increased and vastly exceeded the rate of diffusion of the water monomer. So that's a surprising result given the, the heavier mass of the, of the, of the dimer. And, and, and that's, that's why the, um, you know, the original experimental paper was published in, was published in, in, in nature, in, in science. And so if you then start to think about this, then you know, something like density functional theory is, is if we can accurately describe the binding of the molecule to the surface, if we can accurately describe the intermolecular interaction, we can then hopefully try and explain this, this phenomenon. And so um, 
if you ask how does a single water molecule bond to a, a close packed metal surface, so in this case, a palladium surface, then the molecule likes to lie um, flat on the surface and directly above one of, the, one of the surface metal atoms. And you can then ask, well, you know, how does the molecule diffuse? Um, and, and a single molecule diffuses um, through, by going from a top site to a bridge site to another to another top site, and it, it matters a little bit on what the orientation is, but but not not to any great extent. Then you can ask, well, you know, what does a water dimer look like on this surface, and how might that move? And a water dimer um, has both of the molecules um, um, above individual metal atoms. It forms a single hydrogen bond, and what you see here is one molecule is the donor of the hydrogen bond. And that we'll see in the next slide, that, that bonded relatively strongly to the surface, um, just like the monomer is. The, the other molecule that's accepting the hydrogen bond is, is higher above the surface. And again, if you probe mechanisms for diffusion of this species, um, you, you find that, it, that the low energy barrier, the, the low energy pathway, and takes takes the molecules over over a bridge site. So we have a, we have the the low, low lying donor molecule goes from top to bridge to top, and the high lying molecule follows. So if we look at the water dimer from the side view now, and I said that the donor is is um, is bonded relatively strongly, the acceptor is bonded relatively weakly. It turns out that there's actually a mechanism by which this molecule can rotate. So like a sort of helicopter motion. And this helicopter motion has even been imaged in, in experiments. And so if you, if you then also recognize that hydrogen bonds can very readily exchange. So the role of donor and acceptor can exchange. What you find is that you can, you can actually get the dimer to move across the surface through a more complicated mechanism in which you have this rotation plus exchange followed by rotation. And that was the little movie that, again, will not play, but it was playing um, at the interval between the, between the two segments of the, of the, of the talk. Um, it would be nice if it played, but, but it's not. So essentially, you get this waltzing mechanism. The interesting thing then is, is this exchange of the hydrogen bond, it's known from gas phase spectroscopic work um, that tunneling can be very important to this exchange process. And so we then set about to understand, um, you know, are quantum nuclear effects important to this, to this diffusion process? So if you, again, uh, use density functional theory to compute the barrier for the three processes I've talked about, for the monomer translation, the dimer translation, and now this um, exchange mechanism, you get, you get these three colored bars, you get three barriers that are rather similar. Um, if you then do a sort of simplest account of quantum nuclear effects is to incorporate the zero point energy associated with, 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 the, with the system. If you include that, then what you, you get are these uh, white lines. And what you see is that the monomer um, translation barrier is, is the lowest. So that seems to, to um, contradict the, the, the experiments. If we then add on to the zero point energy, the fact that the system, the protons can tunnel, um, we, we, can, we can then make estimates of the, of the rate. And for these calculations, um, we didn't do full path integral simulations. Instead, we used um, a really nice and powerful approach from Stuart Althorpe and Jeremy Richardson, so, um, in which we did um, instant on calculations. Um, and then we can estimate the rate. And so here we plot the rate of diffusion of the various species as a function of inverse temperature. The monomer process does not depend on tunneling. Um, and so we, we, um, 
um, we have a we have a straight line. Um, the dimer translation mechanism again, there's no tunneling component to that, and it's a straight line always at a lower rate. If we account for tunneling in this exchange process, what we find is that the the um, the tunneling process at sufficiently low temperatures starts to exceed exceed the exceed that exceed the the monomer and the monomer and the dimer translation mechanism. So this tunneling process enables this rapid diffusion across across the surfaces. So that's that's all I want to say. I will wrap things up there. In this second half, again, I've try to provide just a basic introductory level um, um, overview of, of, um, of, of sort of what can be done with ab initio MD and ab initio PIMD. Um, it's, these really are powerful and useful techniques um, and they can be used. I've showed examples of water at surfaces, hydrogen at surfaces, but they, you know, these are general purpose techniques. Um, I've, I've um, made the point that um, machine learning really um, broadens the the range and the power of these of these methods, um, and and enables um, you know more robust um, results to be obtained, and enables um, whole swathes of phase behavior and interesting phenomena that that couldn't really be treated because of because of um, you know, them being too computationally expensive. And so there's really a lot of opportunities, opportunities um, by combining ab initio MD and machine learning. And, and, and also, um, you know, there are many systems where we may not care about quantum nuclear effects, they may not be important, um, but, but then again, there are scenarios where, especially when, when you're dealing with light atoms, hydrogen bonds, um, where quantum nuclear effects can be can be important and need and need to be taken into consideration. So I will stop there, and um, and uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Um, and there's one here. Um, so Jolanda has asked a question: How can we expect? Um, machine learning to be more precise than DFT when we use DFT data as the training set. Um, so we, we cannot, um, so DFT will, um, will not be, the machine learning simulation will not be more um, accurate than, than the DFT. So what, what I was, um, the point I was making here is, is that um, if we're doing uh, molecular dynamics, so DFT-based molecular dynamics. Oh, Yolanda is not here. Oh, she is. Okay. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um, each individual um, energy and force evaluation will only be as good as the DFT. It will not exceed that. Um, but if we are um, computing something that requires um, an ensemble average to be obtained, um, then we can just do better sampling um, and we can get a better estimate of our ensemble average. And so that, that was the, that's the key advantage of, of, uh, of, you know, of using the machine learning. Each, each energy and force evaluation is considerably cheaper. And so we can get many, many more of them. And so then ensemble properties can be computed with um, a significantly smaller statistical mm -hmm. error. So, so that makes sense. I was just wondering that because I think in the, in the first few slides about machine learning, yeah. uh, you presented this graph with uh, accuracy and computational cost where you said, can we get the, both, the best of both worlds yeah. of the, yeah. of the uh, quantum simulations and the, um, and the DFT? And then you kind of put the machine learning over with the accuracy towards the quantum mechanical simulations. Yes. And then afterwards, when you said that you used the, the DFT as a training set, I felt like that was a bit let me, um, let me match up. Yeah, so that is not the intention. Let me find the figure. Um, 
So, so this one. Oh, um, no, oh you're not. I'm not sure. Can't see it at the yeah, moment. Right. Let me share again. Um, there it is. Okay. Can you see that now? Uh, yeah. Am I sharing the right the right one? No. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, where the machine learning approach is on the same level of reliability as the quantum mechanical approaches. Yeah. Um, so, so that is that is that is what we you know that is what we're aiming for. So if mm -hmm. if if we um, if we um, if we do a good quality fitting, um, mm -hmm. you know the so DFT. You know here we could write DFT. If we do a good quality fit of our machine learning potential then we can recover DFT accuracy um, yep. at a reduced cost. Right. That, that's all I'm that, that okay. there. Um, we, this machine learning will never go to a higher accuracy. E exactly, um, yeah. yeah. Um, for, you know, for each individual, you know, energy and force evaluation. Um, okay. All, um, what we can do, you know, and then in the later part, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that if we have a technique that delivers DFT accuracy, but comes at a, at a significantly lower cost, lower cost, then when we're doing molecular dynamics simulations with this, we can look at bigger systems, we can do longer trajectories, and we can get more converged ensemble properties out more yeah. reliable more accurate ensemble properties but okay that, that makes sense yeah. i think just because earlier in the course you presented uh the um quantum monte carlo as more precise than yeah. the dft and uh, when you said quantum mechanical approaches i somehow thought that you you meant here that the accuracy would be matched with that uh, but then you trained it with the yeah. FT. That's why I got confused. Yeah. But it makes okay. sense now. Yeah. Thank you very much for the explanation. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things we're also working on is is then, um, you know, there are like I've said, there's many problems where you know a given DFT functional will will not be will not be good enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're working on and people are working on training machine learning potentials to the higher level quantum methods. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, training um, and 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 usually, you know, you actually it's making a correction to the higher level method. Um, I see. You know, that, that's another another way of, of going about things. Um, any other questions? No, well, um, Thank you, everybody, for joining. I hope that you found the talk um, useful and clear. Um, and um, if anyone has any 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 questions, you know, feel free to to write to me and uh, ask me ask me offline. Um, and I think we can stop there. So um, have a nice afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yep. Thank you for the talk. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Bye.